Hi, Jane. Thanks for talking to me today. Hi, Tashin. So good to be here. So you and I are close friends, but I wanted to have you on to really talk more about um, you and learn about your interests and some of the things that you talk about on Twitter from your own introspection or your own investigations, I think are really fascinating. And I'd love to learn more about them myself as well as share them with the world, give people a sense of kind of where you're coming from and what your context is. So I've been really excited to have this conversation with you. Yeah, me too. Let's do it. Um, yeah, so as usual, I'd love to just start just by hearing from you what your story is and your background, anything that you'd like to share with people about, you know, your own personal history and how you got to where you are today in whatever detail you like. Yeah, wow, it's a big question. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, I mean, I studied math in college, I guess that feels like maybe a reasonable starting point. Um, and I just really liked math growing up. Um, I had a couple other interests like French and psychology, which I ended up minoring in. And um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with that. I thought about going down an engineering path, but I was a little intimidated by engineering. And, but I just knew that I liked math in high school. So I studied that and then um, kind of just fell into a job path. Like it wasn't very intentional. I just, once I graduated from college, I was trying to figure out what to do with a math degree. And it seems like software companies hired math majors. So I ended up becoming a software tester and then very quickly realizing that software development, you know, the engineers at the company were the hot shots and that was kind of where I wanted to be. So after a couple of years in testing, I became a software developer and did that for five years. And, um, you know, that was around like starting in my early mid twenties and a lot of my personal development started really picking up around that time, like sort of getting in touch with spirituality and starting to really question a lot of my patterns and habits and friend groups. And um, around the, probably the same time I started using Twitter and I had never been very online before that. So it just opened up this whole new world for me. And so two years ago, I was living in DC at the time. And then two years ago, I was really ready to leave. And, um, you know, I had been in Montreal for school and then in DC and I was very tired of city life by that point and feeling very drawn to nature. And I had a dog and I didn't have a car and I was spending every weekend trying to like get out of the urban environment with my dog into the woods and not having a car made that really hard. And so it felt like time for a lifestyle change. Um, DC was also just starting to feel very big and impersonal and fast paced. And I was looking for somewhere a little slower paced and quieter and smaller. And so I ended up deciding to move to Asheville, North Carolina, which is a really beautiful little mountain town um, in the Blue Ridge Mountains in Western North Carolina. And uh, so I've been here for the last two years and things really started, I would say, to change for me when I moved here. Um, because I had wondered before I moved if like, maybe I was doing the thing that people do sometimes where there's something wrong in their life and instead of fixing it, they just change location. Like everything will be great once I'm in Asheville, that'll solve all my problems. So I, I was curious, like if I was doing that with, you know, subconsciously and I got here and it was such a, such a quality of life improvement that it was like, okay, good. No, that I really did need to do that. And once that part of my life kind of locked into place, it shined some light on other parts of my life that um, still needed to be clicked into place. Um, like a lot of my personal growth and habits and um, connection with my body and my job, what I was doing. The software development was great in a number of ways, but it was at the end of the day, pretty unfulfilling. Um, and so after a lot of exploration there, I um, ended up leaving my job in May of this year and I started massage school in June. So yeah, that kind of brings us to the present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear, you know, about this connection with your body and some of the limitations that you found that you needed to explore more of. And I imagine that those might be related to like the unfolding of your own spiritual path. 
uh, and just would be curious to hear more about anything in that direction. Yeah, let's see, where to start with that. The first time that I remember really like starting to develop a connection with my body and the way that I think about it now is when I started to learn meditation. But like I was talking to somebody the other day and mentioning this and he was like, but I thought you were like an athlete. And so I was thinking about like, well, yeah, I did play soccer my whole life. And I did, I was very into weightlifting at one point, which I think is like of all of the sports is one where you probably develop the most specific mind muscle connection. And so I did throughout my life have these connections to my body, like through sports. And I was naturally very athletic as a kid. Um, but connecting to your emotional body is very different. And also just walking around with, you know, in an embodied state is different, I think, than being able to just go out on a soccer field and have your muscle memory kind of tell you what to do. Um, so apart from sports, I would say that, uh, I probably downloaded Headspace for the first time, like six, seven years ago. And like learning how to just sit and do a simple body scan in a meditation was like groundbreaking for me. Um, so that's when that, start, like just the ability to move my awareness into different parts of my body that was totally foreign and new and exciting. Um, and looking back now, it's like amazing to me to think for, I think this happened for years. I was never a super consistent meditator, but I would do it off and on. Um, and it's amazing looking back how often I would do body scan meditations and be like, not really anything going on. Can't find any emotions. <laughs> and like, I just thought I was not a very emotional person, you know, um, I, that was kind of what I concluded. And it made sense to me given that I, I was very drawn to like the rationalist community at that point. I was a software developer. I was like living in my head and rational world all day, every day. And so I thought it made, like I would talk to friends who would be so overcome with emotion all the time and all these different situations and be expressing that to me. And I just thought like, I just don't feel things the way that they feel them. And like, I kind of felt a little like low key smug about that, I think. And like, I'm so lucky I can just go about life more easily <laughs> without all of those pesky emotions in the way. Um, but maybe also I felt a little like, sad not like a sociopath but like huh maybe I'm missing out maybe I don't feel the good stuff as strongly either or maybe maybe there's something kind of missing for me looking back I would guess that it's probably a combination of like I just didn't recognize what was there and also just that I had been so disconnected for so long that there was only so much my body was felt comfortable and safe expressing to me and a lot was just hidden deep down and various muscle tensions and things that I didn't even realize were there. Um, but so I don't, if I had cons meditated more consistently, then maybe I would have started to connect to those things more. But I think for me, what really was the breakthrough was trying some types of therapy. And also when I moved to Asheville, meeting people who were, had really high emotional intelligence and could kind of draw it out of me. Um, yeah, let's see. I think it was about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I tried like IFS style shadow work with Chris Orozco. Um, and around the same time I did an energy session with Hanjo. And um, I think that is, that is one of like the landmark moments in terms of connection with my body. Things are really starting to pick up and like recognizing specific um blockages and big things that were stored in various places that I could start to open a dialogue with and start to provide a, a safe space for expression within my own body hmm. yeah I, I think I'd be curious to ask more about those relationships that you had with Chris and Hanjo because not, not in particular but um <clears throat> one of the things that I've noticed about you since very early in our friendship is you know, it seems like you've worked with a lot of different coaches and have this sort of like very eager appetite to grow and learn. And I would just be curious to hear more from you about that and your relationship with coaching and like growing as a person and personal development, like how you, how you think about that kind of a coaching relationship and what you're looking for. 
Yeah, I've done so many. Um, outside of like therapy, maybe they're all therapy. I don't know. <laughs> um, outside of therapy, I did um, writing coaching with Sasha. I've actually never said his last name out loud, so I don't know how to pronounce it. Chapin. Um, that okay, that was totally therapy, but disguised as writing coaching. Um, yeah, I, I could talk about that for like a whole podcast, but I, I wrote a blog post about it. So maybe I'll just um, refer people to that. Um, that was, I mean, that was life changing because it just got me unblocked with writing and writing is such an important form of expression and such an important way to connect to people. Um, yeah, I've through Twitter and like sharing blog stuff through Twitter, I've just had so many amazing connections with people based on stuff that I've written and it's really amazing. Someone was, someone new to our corner of Twitter was remarking recently about how great it is that so many people have blogs and like have them linked in their profiles. And like, it is amazing that so many people that we know, like, are confident in their ability to write and put it out there. But you know, it's really pretty vulnerable to do that. And it's, it's such a nice way to connect to people in, in sort of longer form than Twitter. Um, I probably have since I've started tweeting a lot, I've probably blogged less because I, I do a lot of Twitter threads instead, but it is still a, a different and, and really useful format. But anyway, um, aside from writing, I did career coaching for maybe like six months or so when I first started to feel, um, when I first started to feel like what I was doing was not quite it, but I didn't know where to go from there. Um, so yeah, that was semi-useful. I did, I worked with a nutritionist, which was not a great experience. I have a singing and piano teacher. Um, we were meeting like once a week when we first started and now it's very like uh, kind of random when I meet up with her, but it, yeah, that was also a total game changer in terms of like expressing myself, opening throat chakra. Um, it's probably a pretty common theme throughout my coaching relationships. <laughs> Um, and then on the therapy side, I've worked with a bunch of different people, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's a kind of a pattern for me is doing one to like five sessions with someone and really feeling like, um, okay, yeah, that was amazing. And now I'm ready to go find other tools. I mean, it's such an exciting time in terms of healing all the different modalities that are available and, um, growing in, in awareness out out in the world. So like Chris, let's see, I've only done traditional talk therapy, like th maybe three sessions of that. And uh, I don't have anything against it. I probably will go back to it at some point, but um, I really connected with Chris's IFS shadow, shadow work style. Um, and I loved Hanjo's style. I have worked with Hanjo, I think four different times over about nine months so I really like that format like because it leaves all this integration time in between sessions and so I can come back to him after two months and be like hey after we did this I had all of these corresponding shifts and here's where I am now let's do another evaluation and see what we can get shifting in the next couple of months so I really appreciate when that's an, a, an option rather than like hey we have to do this container of this number of sessions and this number of weeks um, this isn't really a coach, but I mean, I've, um, I have a massage therapist, so I've been seeing regularly. We've probably done like between 10 and 15 sessions together. And that's like one of the best of that site, like therapy relationships I have in my life, hands down. Um, it's, yeah, I didn't, it's been really inspiring to me as I started massage school. And I mean, it was part of the reason why I decided to go to massage school is I had no idea that that type of healing was possible through massage. And so I've tried to write about it a little bit because I think that a lot of people still don't know that that's even possible. I'm still learning every time I see him what's possible with massage. Um, let's see. Yeah, I have tried a bunch of different things. I actually just started working with someone who does a kind of a combination of ETF tapping, I, I, emotional EFT, emotional freedom technique tapping and like IFS, somatic experiencing. Um, I also started working with Sarah McManus recently and she does like an IFS, somatic experiencing style thing. Um, I've 
sort of struggled with disordered eating off and on for the last like 13 years. And I have been doing all of this other healing, which made it feel like it was possible to start working with that. I had pretty much given up for years on fixing that. And so I've been working with Sarah and Jeff, the, the one who does um, the tapping and IFS for the last couple of weeks. Um, I think that different people have different learning styles and some people just really love to dive in on their own and figure things out from scratch. And I think that that is something that's traditionally been hard for me. Uh, I have always done really well with a teacher. Um, yeah, I'm thinking that, yeah, it's definitely kind of a pattern in my life. Like when I was learning how to lift, having someone at the gym with me who could like watch me lift and give me direct feedback on my technique, um, who's always way better than just like looking stuff up on the internet and then going and trying to figure it out. Um, I think it helps a lot too with like certain things that I have around confidence and around um, sometimes when I feel overwhelmed, I sort of just shut down. It even happens to me when like someone sends me a really long text or a really long DM or something like I'll see a block of text and my brain will just go, nope, it'll go blank and like, be like, okay, maybe I'll come back to that later, I hope. <laughs> um, so I kind of get that same feeling when I'm trying to learn something new and starting from scratch and just the vast expanse of, of, of territory is overwhelming. And so having a teacher kind of like hold my hand through it, I, I really appreciate. And I just really like having um, a role model, somebody to espouse. Like, I think probably eventually I could get to the point where I trust that I can manifest anything, but it, for now, I really appreciate having people that I can see and point to and say, okay, that person has done it. Now I can do it too. I mean, um, yeah, that's been such a pattern for me. I've mentioned that to you with your relationship. It's like, wow, it's really nice to see a relationship like that. Now I feel like that is, is possible for me. Um, when I left my job to, to go to massage school, I had a lot of feelings of like, is this crazy? Am I being really idealistic? Is this, does everyone, like a lot of people said things like, yeah, it's work. No one likes work. You know, it's just something you have to do and you have it so good. And I did have it so good in terms of stability and benefits and pay and everything. But I know some people, a couple people in my life who like just so connect with what they do and are so passionate about it and work doesn't feel like work to them because it's what they would be doing anyway. And so seeing those people made me realize that I could have that for myself too. So I think that's why um, I've been so drawn to coaching relationships. And also now that I am working towards becoming a therapist in a, you know, a space holder, that's another reason why I really love experimenting with these different modalities of therapy now is sort of for my own healing purposes, but also sort of taking notes on like I, the emotional freedom technique, the tapping, maybe I can find a way to work that into massage. I mean, there's so many ways, so many avenues you can go with massage and I would love to pull a lot of various modalities in. And, and I'm also just very lucky that I have the resources from having worked in tech all those years and having money saved. And, um, you know, I'm only in massage school part-time right now. So I have a lot of time. So healing is a huge priority for me and it is incredibly time and energy intensive and so yeah I have sort of the time and space and money right now to be doing it so it feels like the best thing to do for myself and for everyone else as a result beautiful beautiful um <clears throat> I'd be curious to ask a, a sort of practical question of like say you start a coaching relationship with someone and you know, you're setting out to do something like one to five sessions with them on something specific, like, how do you internally know when you're done or when you've gotten what you're looking for? Like, how do you relate to that? Hmm. I think it just happens naturally. If, yeah, I'm, I'm, experimenting a lot these days with like planning and scheduling and to-do lists because for so much of my life I was like an avid note taker an avid to-do list maker and like drove myself a little crazy with all my endless to-do lists and stuff and so as I've tried to shift into 
doing things, not because I have to, or not because I'm scared of what would happen if I didn't do it, but doing it because I want to. When I left my job, I think I didn't make a list or make a concrete plan for like two months. So it's just like, <laughs> F that I need, I need time and space and I need to not look at a to-do list for a while. Um, but now I'm starting to slowly find my way back. And so I'm finding that like making, leaving space for flexibility, but also making some plans is, you know, there's a nice balance there. And I think if you can do that in therapeutic and coaching relationships, it's great. Like, okay, probably we're going to need at least three sessions here. We could say that. Um, and then maybe we could go from there on the third session. We could see. And when I worked with Sasha, I think it was very clear, like when we were done, um, I almost sort of feel like he, <laughs> he, sort of ended the therapeutic relationship with me like okay Jane you really don't need me anymore it's nice to talk but like <laughs> you're you're writing it's happening the writing is good it's you you now write the same way that you speak which you didn't when we started working together so I mean I had gone in with like a very specific I have this idea that I want to write about one time I sat down and tried to get it out and like nothing good happened what do I do and by the time I finished we did four sessions together I think I, I ended with five drafts and like, oh my God, the difference between the first draft and the fifth draft. I think you've read both the first draft and the fifth draft. It's like, I was so excited about where we had gotten and I was, I was already sharing it with people in my life. And like, it, it was just a very clear and natural end. And um, the two people that I'm working with now, I think it will be similar because uh, it's this very specific goal of working through this disordered eating pattern. And so I think as that becomes consistently, um, not necessarily fit, like better as, as I'm just happier with where things are with my, my eating habits, I think that I will stop working with them. But I've also talked to them about how it's, it, it has gotten better before and then it's gotten really bad again. So it's possible that in a couple of months I'll call them and be like, Hey, things fell off. Can we, can we meet again? And so it's another reason why I really like having that sort of flexibility of, cause that's just how things go in life is like, you think you work through something. I've noticed this, this is like a total trap, especially when you bring the mentality of like achievement to therapy and then you'll tell people like, guys, guess what? I cleared this trauma and it's gone forever and I'm never going to get triggered in this way ever again. And then the next day something happens and you get triggered and you're like, oh, fuck, I don't want to tell anyone that this triggered me because I already told them that <laughs> I moved past this, <laughs> you know? So um, being very humble with that sort of thing is good because I think that there's always new ways that we're going to get triggered by our old stuff, you know? And um, there are certain, like, I, I imagine the next time I'm in a romantic relationship, it'll bring up all kinds of stuff that I thought I had moved through, you know? So um, let's see, back to your question of how, I think just a natural conclusion. I've also worked with people whose rates are really high. And I think that that has, um, that's definitely been a factor, you know? It's like, okay, let's see what we can get done in two or three sessions. Cause I don't really want to, be paying this, um, you know, this monthly amount for, for six months would be, a, would be a lot. So that can play in as well. But I think just getting to a point where another thing I really appreciate is when people are not trying to make a lifelong client out of you. Um, and they're trying to give you a skill set that you can go off and apply on your own. And I think that all of those people that I mentioned, and there's more people that I've worked with too, who've been great, who I haven't mentioned, but all those people that I've mentioned have really felt strongly about teaching me a toolkit that I can apply on my own. And so like, for example, with Hanjo, it's great because he'll teach me all this new stuff. I think we did, in our first session, we did the like all the upper body chakras. And then second session, we did all of the lower body ones. And then following sessions, we would just, he would sort of connect to my emotional body and, or to my energy body and just see what was going on and give me an evaluation from there and some tips and so it's great because every time I'll come back to him and he'll give me some new things for the toolkit that you know based on stuff that I've implemented from the last time so yeah I think things usually come to a natural conclusion and then maybe sometime later things will come back up and it's nice to be able to go back to that person at that point hmm. yeah I'm hearing that all of that is possible because of 
having a pretty clear and specific goal that you're going into it with. And then you can sort of check back and be like, yeah, after these two or three or four or five sessions or whatever, we've made significant progress and maybe I'll check back in in the future. But having a clear reason why you're doing the coaching seems to really help set the ground for that. Does that seem fair? I think that's mostly been true for me, but I'm just thinking like, there's also just stuff that's fun. I really love singing. Like my teacher mm. and I don't even do much. We do a little bit of like, you know, um, drills and stuff at the beginning of it, but we really just love singing together. And so mm. a lot of our lessons will just end up being us singing duets together. And it like makes both of us so happy. And so at this point we'll like, just do a lesson maybe once a month or something and we'll do some warm warm ups and drills and she'll she'll still teach me stuff but we'll spend a lot of the lesson just singing together and having a great time and mm -hmm. like I don't even really feel like I have goals there I really want to do an open mic night with her I think that would be great in terms of like pushing myself to do something new because I'm like terrified of public mm -hmm. speaking even let alone singing um, but I don't really have goals when it comes to like singing and piano. It's really just for fun, but I still like having that relationship open. Um, and then maybe there's other like techniques that I, I don't know that I went into the sessions with Hanjo having a specific goal. I just like, when Hanjo came onto my radar and I saw that he did energy work and I saw what people were saying about it. I don't know if you've read the reviews for his energy sessions, but they're like bananas, the, how complimentary and positive they are. Like this person changed my life like over and over again. And so I, when I read the reviews, I was like, okay, I just need to see what this is about. I didn't even know what energy work was. I didn't necessarily believe in, you know, I would like roll my eyes when people would mention energy and chakras and stuff and so I don't think I was necessarily going into that with um any more of a goal than like let's just see what's what's going on here and then it it ended up um developing into something really cool so I mean if you have the resources and time and curiosity to do that and there is some modality that catches your eye or even like I think Daniel Ingram was talking about this on his podcast like the modality is not even necessarily important. What's really important is your connection with the therapist or coach. Like, and I really think that's true. And so finding somebody that resonates with you and um, yeah, just giving their modality a shot. And even if you don't have a specific goal, probably something will come up very quickly that wants attention and expression and is looking for the right space. And once you have that space holder who your body feels completely comfortable and safe with and loved by, probably stuff's gonna come up. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I'd love to circle back to something you alluded to before, which was doing shadow work and IFS style stuff. And um, I remember one of the first tweets that I saw from you that I really liked quite a bit was about this. And you said uh, something like Twitter is an excellent tool for finding my shadow and shoving it in my face. <laughs> and, you know, for me, that tweet, um, I've never formally done shadow work, but that tweet sort of pointed out to me, oh, this is what shadow work is and what this looks like. And I, I kind of just got a like a sense of like, oh, this is what you can do. And Twitter is really good for it. And this explains like experiences I've been having. And I can use this in a fruitful way to like, um, you know, do personal growth essentially and really have iterated on that a lot. And um, yeah, so I'd be curious to hear you talk more about the shadow work that you did both in general and of course with Twitter in particular. Yeah, totally. Um, let's see. I mean, like, everything around us is a mirror all the time, right? Like all these different things and people in our lives can be mirrors for us and show us aspects of ourselves that um, could use some love and attention. And my dog is a great example. She's such a mirror. And like, I don't have kids, but I've heard a lot of people with kids say the same thing that like your kids are the ultimate mirror. And so um, you know, invitation for expansion and growth. And I really noticed that when I started using Twitter, like when I, I've been on Twitter for years, but I didn't start actually tweeting until like a year ago. 
And when I did, I, I just noticed, like, I felt bad using Twitter a lot. Like it was, it was amazing in so many ways, but also sometimes it felt like it would tank my mental health. And I was like, what, what's going on? What is this? And, um, yeah, I just started to realize that there were like certain people who I felt like it wasn't that they were being negative or mean or cruel. It was quite the opposite. They were really lovely people. And for some reason, seeing what they tweeted or the responses that they got, it was like really negatively affecting me. Um, I've told Darby this, uh, she was one who, who triggered me. I don't think I've told Miss G, but she was also another one. And so probably the fact that it was both of them showed me a pattern there of like, oh yeah, women who are both really beautiful and really smart, especially in this like really high verbal skill kind of way. This is triggering me, huh? I wonder what that is. What kind of stories do I have about <laughs> women <laughs> and whether you're allowed to be both beautiful and smart and like, why does that make me feel bad about myself? And so, um, yeah, there's, uh, it's just, I think you and I were tweeting about this recently and then Mandy, oh no, um, Yatharth, I'm not sure if that's how you say his name, but um, he, he tweeted something about this and said, why is Twitter such a mirror or why is it such a great tool for shadow work? And Mandy uh, at which Wolves responded that it's not just that everyone is a mirror, but like people are all using communication pattern, like their own personal communication styles and it might not be your preferred way of doing it. Um, there were a couple others, but it was a really, um, she was really on the mark with that. Like, we can rearrange our lives or arrange our lives so that we're not getting triggered. You know, we can have people only treat us certain ways and we can be very clear about our love languages so that people use those. But like Twitter is just the wild west in terms of, I mean, you can curate it, obviously. I could have just unfollowed Miss G and, and Darby um, when I noticed them triggering me, but it's, it was, it's been great to, be able to set the boundaries exactly where I want. Like, okay, I can see this person's triggering me, but I'm not really ready to work through this or this is too painful or I just have too much going on right now. So I'm gonna unfollow them for right now. But like, maybe I'll come back to this later. Um, so you can really do shadow work at whatever pace you want with Twitter. Um, let's see, there's something else I was gonna say about that. Oh, another example, this is sort of a different, um, at Hormiz pointed out the other day that there's more to shadow work than just like um, getting triggered. Like I would say that, so the way that I found myself in this corner of Twitter was kind of through the rationalist community, which I found through Ayla. I don't remember how I found her, but she's the first one who kind of led me down this rabbit hole. And I followed her for years. I was just totally mesmerized by her as soon as I found her. And um, I used to experience all this like intense, envy like about her um i really loved her writing so many of her blog posts have have been really um educational for me and just really stayed with me for years but also i just really envied her in a lot of ways and it was really interesting to me to notice that because i don't i don't honestly experience that much envy like in my day-to-day -day life i feel like usually if there's something that i want I really want it, I can figure out how to get it and make it happen. So I was really struck by how envious I was of Ayla and it made me realize that there were certain like values that I claimed to have, like openness would be a big one. And I realized when I saw how open she was that I was not being open actually, especially online. And I really wanted to be is like, why, why can this person speak so freely about her life and I can't? Like, I, I was dying to be that open and vulnerable, but I didn't know how to with the way that my life was set up. And so, um, also Ayla, before I even had heard the term shadow work or knew anything about that, I was struck by the fact that she was basically doing public shadow work on Twitter, like, in front of tens of thousands of people, however many people follow her, you know, like she would always be talking about these, what I would think of as embarrassing and shameful thoughts and feelings that she was having. And she was doing it totally shamelessly and openly. And it's like, wow, I can't even talk about the not embarrassing stuff about my life online. And she's talking about everything. Like it was so inspiring to me. So I think that's an example of someone who, she wasn't triggering me, but she was 
just showing me, I think that's the beauty of envy is it shows you someone who's living out a value that you claim to have, but you're not actually living by. So it's like, I either have to give up on this as being a value or I have to change my life so that I'm actually um, living this because, you know, your values aren't what you say they are. It's the way you live your life. Um, let's see, I'm a little hesitant to get into this stuff with Chris because, um, I mean, I could talk about maybe just not some of the specific stuff that we worked through, but um, sort of the process. So I would either wait until something triggered me specifically, or we would figure out how to sort of connect with it in terms of um, imagining triggering scenarios and that sort of thing could, could actually be really helpful in, in triggering the feelings in my body. And then, um, yeah, let's see. So we would then find it, find the, sens find the sensation and he would have me like describe it as much as possible. Does it have a color? Does it have um, a shape? Is it hot, cold, et cetera? And that part was, I found really hard. And um, yeah, I guess that a lot of the time I felt like I was kind of guessing, you know, it's like, is this, is this thing actually like circular and red and hot? Or am I just trying to give Chris an answer? Like a lot of my kind of like people pleasing stuff played into it's like, Am I trying to be good at therapy? <laughs> trying to be good at shadow work. Um, and so, but I just, you know, I did my best and I was still really learning how to develop this connection with my body. And then once we found something, he really taught me how to open a dialogue with it and um, name the sense, name the, the emotion there. And that's, you know, similar to, I think what Dr. Doug Tataran does with bioemotive of saying stuff out loud to see what, actually resonates um so we would find the one that he and I we worked on like one main one that had been triggering me for my whole life and I hadn't really ever known what was going on and uh, I found like a lot of fear there I found it very clearly in my chest heart area and um I didn't know what the fear was and so the first I mean this all happened just within our first session together um and it was I found myself very emotional right away. I think that can happen with really skilled space holders is your stuff just immediately comes up because it senses that safety there and that you're with someone who knows how to handle you and accept you. And so I just found my stuff coming up right away. I could feel intense fear, but I he asked if I could, you know, ask the fear what it was afraid of. And that's where the healing would really start when we got an answer there and could could work with that and um protect it you know and on that first session i couldn't get an answer i just i felt really intensely afraid and i just started to sort of like shut down kind of go offline dissociate a little bit it was just very overwhelming and so it was like okay this is a clearly a stopping point let's stop here we'll reconvene and I think we were doing every two weeks and he was super available over text while we worked together which I really appreciated so he really encouraged me to do this kind of nightly practice and then whenever I hit a, a, a stumbling point I could reach out to him and talk to him about it between our sessions which was awesome and um, the nightly practice could either be trying to connect with that specific fear or another thing that he suggested that I love is like to just sit down and close your eyes and do a, a sort of a meditation, but think about how exactly you want your life to look. Like, what is your ideal life? What are your wildest dreams? And pay attention to the voices that, as you're picturing that, what voices come up that tell you that you can't have that? And that's where the work is to be done. Um, another gem, he's full of gems. I just can't say enough good things about Chris. Like go talk to him, listen to the podcast he's been on, go work with him. He's amazing. Another gem, um, we talked and worked on some, talked about and worked on some stuff related to romantic relationships and stuff that I had coming up related to like insecurities around my intelligence and how that's played out in romantic relationships, you know, like uh, somebody who I find really intelligent, I'll be really attracted to and want to date them. And then I'll feel like 
a lot of relief in terms of having the status of being that person's partner, but then constantly um, insecure about whether I'm actually smart enough and like, oh, this person's going to find out any day that I'm actually really dumb and then they'll break up with me. So we worked on a lot of romantic relationship stuff and uh, I, something that he left me an exercise there is like, okay, imagine someone that you're extremely attracted to, like you would just love to be with this person. Sit with that and what voices come up that tell you that you're not worthy of that person. And like, that's, that's where the work is to be done. And so I think Nick Camaretta has some tweet about how like basically every problem we ever have is a self-love problem. <laughs> like um, a lot of this, I think at the end of the day does come back to like, where are we not loving ourselves and accepting ourselves fully? And that ended up being what I worked on a lot with Chris. Um, and oh, the fear thing, I'll come back to that. So I ended up meditating on that most nights between after our first session. And I started to get what I thought was an answer about what the fear was. But again, I couldn't tell if it was a genuine answer or if it was like me kind of intellectualizing it. Like, well, what would a kid in that situation be afraid of? Probably this, you know, or like me just trying to rush the process a little bit and come up with something. And so I asked Chris about that. And he again recommended the biomotive thing of trying it out loud to see if it resonated. And so I tried saying, I'm scared that, and the answer that I thought it was, and I just broke down sobbing. It's like, mm. okay, I found it, you know, this is it. And yeah, I, even just saying that and recognizing that and sitting with it, I felt this like massive release. And it's, I mean, it's still a trigger for me. I, um, you know, I, I, I still get triggered pretty much anytime this thing happens, but I, it's changed a lot. My relationship with it has shifted. The panic response that I have is a lot different. It's a lot, um, it's a lot smaller and I can get closer to, I'm not like afraid of what I'll do as a result. I can come to my risk, my reaction with a lot more curiosity and love. And, um, it's shifted a lot. And that was such a game changer because it was something that I've been triggering me my whole life. And I just like, I had sort of arranged my life in a lot of ways to avoid it. And so, um, yeah, the possibilities with shadow work, I think are endless. Mm. Yeah, I'd be curious to ask more about how you would engage with someone on Twitter that does trigger you in some way. Like say, say you're on Twitter after this call and, uh, you know, you find this new account that's triggering for you in a new way or something, how would you relate to using that as the basis for shadow work? Um, so I usually don't, I, I know that you and I have talked about having conversations with people about them triggering you or about you triggering them. Um, I usually don't start there. I often don't do it at all, honestly. Like it feels like most of the time it has nothing to do with that person and everything to do with me. Um, so just noticing it and having the distance, having a little distance from it is, is step one, you know, just being able to notice the pattern and notice that this person's affecting you in that way. And um, yeah, maybe writing about it, seeing where, where that takes you, seeing what you can figure out. Um, and Again, I think setting, like I said before, setting boundaries accordingly, like we don't have to heal everything all at once. We don't all have to get enlightened tomorrow. We don't all have to completely work through everything right away. And like, I've definitely, like looking back, even on my tweets throughout my healing journey, I see a lot of like rushing and like achievement focus you know and um i think taking things slowly and letting your body dictate the pace not just the pace but also what wants to be worked on and what it's ready to work on is really important and so setting boundaries and i think um you and i have also talked a lot about boundaries and how they shift over time and i think that this is a good example like figure out what you're ready to work on what you want to work on and um like 
how much you're able to take on at a time. It might just be a little bit at a time and set boundaries around that to protect yourself. Because otherwise you're going to be re-triggering yourself and really hurting yourself and um, bringing on all of this emotional response that you can't properly handle. Um, Especially depends what else is going on in your life and how busy you are and how much time and energy and space you have to devote to this. But um, yeah, I think figuring out how, how you're being triggered, what it's, where it's coming from, what patterns do you have that this is like interrupting? What beliefs do you have that this is putting into question? What, um, what limits to your own self-love do you have that this is showing you, you know? And then where do you go from there? Maybe it's something you can work on on your own. Maybe you can examine it yourself. Maybe it would be better to work with someone um, who can hold some space for you. Like I was saying before, how um, when you work with a really skilled space holder and your stuff comes up right away, I was talking to Sarah McManus about this the other day because I was just blown away in our first session how much like the energy movement that was happening was totally wild. And I was like trying, I was saying to her, I do this sort of internal work with myself all the time, but I, it, I don't have this kind of movement. This is amazing. And she said that like, you know, I think a lot of our parts have these kind of like lifeguard, these dual roles. My dog is being so loud right now. <laughs> um, like these kind of dual roles where they're doing their thing and then they're also lifeguarding the whole time. And when there is a space holder there for you, um, they can sort of provide that role of lifeguard and your parts can just open up and totally be themselves. So in that way, being held in a safe space in a safe container is I think better than doing work on your own. Um, you know, it's everyone should find the right balance for them. But I think that sometimes we just want to be witnessed to, you know, sometimes we just don't even need somebody else to say much or do much, but like just being with a friend while we're working through stuff, someone who can witness our deepest, darkest shadow stuff and still just put a hand on our back and love us through it all is like really what we need. I went to um, a grief ritual recently. Um, yeah, Elena from Twitter at relic underscore radiation invited me and it was such a cool experience. It was like, it was, I won't go into all of it because there is a lot there to talk about, but um, when people were experiencing grief and expressing it and moving through it, we just have someone else who is at the ritual come and put a hand on their back and do nothing else. Like don't rub them. Don't try to fix them. Don't try to talk to them about it. Don't try to take away the pain, but just be there and witness it and put a loving hand on their back. And that's like really what we need a lot of the time. So yeah. I, does that answer the question? Definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah. I think you're making a lot explicit and sort of teasing it out in a really helpful way. Um, and you touched on something else that I would really like to talk a bit about, which is boundaries. And I think uh, a lot of people talk about boundaries, but I like the way that you talk about it and the way that you practice it. And I know I've learned a lot from seeing you talk about it on Twitter and from talking about it with you. And so I'd like to dive into that a bit more. And maybe you could just start by sharing how you got interested in boundaries and how you started learning about boundaries. Yeah, I don't know that there's like a specific starting point that I remember. I mean, I think we all do this all the time without explicitly calling it boundaries, you know, but like, mm -hmm. probably like most people, um, it's from having my boundaries totally obliterated, <laughs> and mm -hmm. then reeling from that and trying to figure out what happened and, and come back from that. Um, oh. I think I'm gonna, do you mind if I get up for a second? If I Please. let her in the room, I think that she'll be a little quieter. All right, I'm back. Um, so yeah, like an example would be, I remember one time when I was like maybe 21 or so, 
I had sex with somebody and felt fine about it at the time. And then like the next, it was probably two or three days. I just felt awful. Like it's like an emotional hangover. I just felt so gross. And like, again, I didn't have the connection to my body or like the emotional vocabulary to really know what was happening, but I knew that something was wrong. Like something just didn't feel good. And I think that is, was like a clear sign that a boundary had been crossed as like someone I shouldn't have had sex with and a situation that I shouldn't have been in. And like, it was very notable, but it was also not something that changed right away because there's so, you know, so much playing into that. Like my dynamics with men, my ideas of romantic relationships and my people pleasing tendencies, you know, it wasn't going to shift overnight just because I recognized I didn't feel good afterward, but it was a very clear signal to me to like change something in the future. And I think that this can happen in any kind of relationship that we have. Um, You've tweeted about this recently and I heard someone say something really similar on a podcast maybe two years ago and it really stuck with me. It's like, if you have a friend that you spend time with and you you don't feel good after, if you feel kind of icky, like icky, I think is actually the perfect way to describe how I felt that, you know, for the next few days, that time when I was 21. Um, it's a, that's the signal that a boundary is not being set that needs to be set. It's a sign from your body that it's not feeling safe with that person. And I've had situations where I've been kind of confused. Like I love this person and I feel bad after I hang out with them. What's, what's up with that? Like, should I cut this person out of my life? Are they not actually good for me? Why would I feel bad after I spend time with a friend, you know, or like not necessarily that icky feeling, but maybe I would come home and binge eat or do something else, some other kind of coping behavior. Um, cause I would just come home feeling discombobulated or something. And so that, I think just those experiences and also, you know, spending when I moved here and met one friend in particular, Walker, who's very, um, emotionally intelligent and has a lot of experience with therapy and knows a lot about boundaries. She and I have talked a lot about it and I've learned a lot from her too. Um, and I think just from a lot of experimentation, you know, with, with what works and what doesn't work and, um, understanding safety signals from your body at the end of the day, I think boundaries are basically all about safety. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it, but I think that everyone's are going to be different and they're all changing all the time and they're different with different people in our lives. And it just takes a lot of experimentation and constant communication. And the beauty of it, I think it's really empowering when you do set strong boundaries, it feels like it's going to be almost like cruel or mean or something or put people off but I find it it tends to be the opposite like sometimes it does put people off and some people don't want to respect your boundaries and that's good information you know I think it's it's a sign that something there needs to change maybe you do need to to cut that person out of your life or you know just keep strictly enforcing your boundaries but you what I find is that with most people in my life it really improves the relationships because it takes the guesswork out. And when we don't have to constantly be guessing at each other's boundaries, it just makes the relationship so much smoother. And it, there's so much more space there for exploration and growth and love in within boundaries that you're both comfortable and safe with. Um, and yeah, I think my friendship with Walker is a really beautiful example of that, of like, we've been tinkering with it for two years now that we've known each other and we just know each other so well at this point in terms of boundaries and love languages and stuff. And we're very different people, but because we have that shared understanding and we're so open with our communication, it's like, we're both just creating this dream friendship with each other, you know? Um, so I guess that's how I think about it. I don't think I started explicitly thinking about sort of boundaries as a specific subject until um, six months ago or something, but yeah. Can you tell me a story about like a specific boundary that you set, um, or sometime that you set a boundary? Hmm.
It's hard to think of a really specific example, but I think that an example of like a type of boundary that I set a lot is just around my time and energy. Um, I've become a lot different in the way that I reply to people. Um, text is like the main way that people communicate now. And it's actually like a really difficult form of communication for me, The like, asynchronous nature of it and like now that I'm in massage school and my hands and thumbs are kind of sore all the time I'm even finding that like it just doesn't really work for me mechanically but um I think that I used to feel a lot of pressure to respond to people right away whether it was an email or a text or whatever type of message and whatever type of content it was and I kind of mentioned earlier the overwhelmed thing that I get and so I would just I feel that a lot with reading material too like there's so much stuff that I'm interested in. There's so much great, you know, we live in, in the age of information, but there's also only so much brain space that I have. And um, my brain is just exhausted a lot of the time. And there's only so much reading that I can do and want to do. And I, I want to be very choosy about what I'm doing. And so people send me like reading material a lot. And I really, really appreciate that. Like in terms of just recognizing the love underneath that act. I really appreciate that someone thinks of me and thinks I would connect with this material and, you know, actually goes through with sending it to me. I can really appreciate that without feeling obligated to reading it at all or in any kind of timely manner. Um, same goes with, with Twitter and DMs and stuff. Like I notice that when I get busier, I kind of stop being so online and maybe I won't someone will tag me in a tweet or respond to something I say and I'll get back to it like a week or two later sometimes I actually just lose track of them and I've kind of been wanting to tweet recently like hey if you ever reply to me and I don't ever reply just like feel free to ping me and follow up because like it's way easier to keep track of dms than it is notifications um but anyway, I think like having very explicit boundaries around my time and energy has been totally game changing for me of like, I'm going to reply to that text in three days, maybe, you know, rather than feeling like I need to do it right away. And I had a lot of like guilt around that before. And, you know, I think it just ran my energy down all the time. It's, it's in, like, I don't, when you start to set these boundaries around your energy I think you'll find that your energy store is totally different as a result like I don't like replying to people out of a feeling of obligation and guilt anyway you know it really changes the tone of the response and the, the content of the response like I said this to you actually with something that you just shared with me some writing that you did and I said like hey I said I was going to read it on this day but I'm actually going to do it on this day I don't I didn't want to read it because I told you I was going to read it on that day. I didn't want to go into reading it with that mentality because I'm really excited to read it. I want to bring my full attention to it. And I want to come from a place of like, wow, I'm so stoked to read this thing that Tasha wrote rather than like, ah, oh, fuck, I'm exhausted. But I told Tasha and I would read this today. So let me read it and get this over with, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, um, yeah, like a specific example from a relationship in my life isn't coming up, but those time and energy boundaries have been crucial for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a great example. Like this text that I got from you yesterday that you sent of like, you're like, Hey, I'm going to read this, but not today. And I'm really excited to read it. And I want to come from this place of enjoyment rather than obligation. And um, yeah, I guess that has me curious because I think this is, there's multiple facets of the way that you talk about and practice boundaries that I really like. Like, I don't know. Um, but this really gets to it of like, there's kind of two things that I'm noticing when I try to, uh, implement what I've learned from you about boundaries, just from watching you talk about it and hearing you talk about it. Um, well, well, so there's a few things. One, one is just like, yeah, boundaries are very helpful and like being clear on my boundaries is really helpful. And to the extent that I'm able to honor and articulate them and share them with someone else and they're respected like that's so helpful you know it's great like that's why I'm so excited about it. it's like wow this frees up so much energy and makes it a lot easier to connect but then I noticed there's like um and this is I'm sure due to my own lack of skill but I think you're incredible at this like there's sort of two failure modes with boundaries for me of like one 
if I set a boundary, like um, it isn't received well and people don't like it and they sort of push away. And yeah, it could be, it could be kind of a signal about them, but I think it ha happens often enough that I'm sure I'm doing it in a way that's not great. And similarly, often when people set boundaries with me, like I sort of feel rejected or hurt, or like sometimes even it feels like their boundaries aren't like taking into account my own needs or like what I might need, for example. Um, and so like, it feels like there can be some kind of either explicit conflict or just like emotional lack of resolution where it's like, this didn't feel great. And I imagine sometimes when I'm setting boundaries myself with other people that that sort of similar thing is happening for other people where they're like, oh, that didn't feel good. I don't like how he set that boundary and this doesn't make me feel good or feel seen. And that doesn't happen all the time, but I've really noticed when you set boundaries with me, like, you know, other than this text being recent, like I, I, I'm, I'm like very confident you've set boundaries with me like multiple times. And I just like, can't think of them because it's just felt so smooth and seamless. And it's like, oh, thank you so much for telling me that, you know, um, yeah, like I, I can kind of think of them now, but it was just like, oh, thank you. Like that was so well done. And it's clear it's not like about me. It's just like what you need for yourself. And like, this is how to be a good friend to you or like the way that we need to be connected right now. And it just feels so smooth and seamless. And, you know, I'm, I'm sort of playing it up a little bit and describing it of like my own response to other people's boundaries typically, or like the way that other people might respond to my boundaries. But I do think that there's, um, some work to be done there in terms of like how gracefully or lovingly I establish those boundaries and also how gracefully and lovingly I receive others' boundaries. And so I'd just be curious to hear you talk about that, like how to both set and receive boundaries with that kind of smoothness, that grace, that love, mutual understanding, that kind of thing. Yeah, totally. I'm curious if you feel like sharing, do you like, could you give an example of a way that you have set a boundary um, that maybe wasn't received super well? Does that something like that come to mind and you're open to sharing it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let me just think for a second. Uh, there's there's a few things I could sort of feel into. Um, oh yeah, sure. This is a good example. So um, we'll just be anonymous here because that's easier. Uh, someone reached out to me by text message that I don't typically talk to. And they were like trying to get in touch with me. It was really nice. It was nice to hear from them by text message. It was like, oh, this is interesting. And then, um, you know, they were like texting me pretty regularly and a lot. And it was like a little bit strange, like their sense of humor is different. And like the things that they're interested in is different. And like, basically it felt like we weren't quite vibing. Like I liked hearing from them when I hadn't heard from them in a long time, but there was just something off and it didn't, you know, really feel that good to me. And then, um, yeah, I mentioned a specific uh, topic in passing that was just like, oh, this is something I'm interested in right now. And I think my sense is that that like triggered them quite a bit for a reason, just for their own reasons. And they like, uh, how to put it? Um, how to they they sent me like a lot of messages of like just like ranting about this thing that I had just mentioned in passing you know and like going off on a specific point that they wanted to communicate and I was like um yeah so then I decided to set a boundary I was like I don't want to um talk about this by text message basically and if you want to talk to me about this let's talk about it over the phone or a video call or in person that would have been logistically possible with this person. Um, like, I, I just don't want to talk about this right now by text message. And um, I think one of the things that went wrong was like, initially I sent that to them by voice memo and like, I didn't know this, but like, it seemed like they didn't want voice memos. Like a boundary that they had was like, I don't want to receive voice memos, um, which I just didn't know, but it felt easier to say that with kind of compassion and, and clarity by a voice memo rather than saying it by text. And then they, but they didn't want to receive a voice memo. Um, yeah, and then they, so I set this boundary and then they they set a boundary with like blocking me on text message just because I said this. And, um, you know, which is 
fair. I, I didn't even know you could block people on text message until this situation. Uh, I was like, thought that was just on Twitter or something. But anyway, you can block people by text message. Good to know. Uh, useful to have in the old department uh, in the repertoire. Um, anyway, I boundary repertoire <laughs> yeah that's right so i got blocked on text message because i set a boundary and uh you know it was initially by voice memo and then i said set it by text and i just said like i don't want to talk about this by text message let's talk on about it in you know a more high bandwidth way um i think it was pretty sudden too like and they were already triggered you know uh and i was just i was just like i i am so disinterested in this topic i don't want to be having an argument about this. It's not something I want to argue about. I don't want to argue about it with you. If it's really important to you to talk about it to me, which I could see that it was, then like, let's do it in an actual conversation and not by text message. Um, so that I felt good about that. I was like, yeah, I found this boundary and it's like pretty clear that I don't want to argue about this, but, and I like gave them kind of a way out of if they do want to talk about it to me, if it is important to them, that there is this way that I would prefer to talk about it. Um, but I did not want to talk about it over text message. I didn't want to get like, you know, I was getting like 12, 15 text messages from them about this when I was like, not, I, I just mentioned something in passing. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the situation. And I think that that example actually hits both of them of like me setting a boundary and it not being well received. And then also someone else setting a boundary and like, yeah, I didn't feel great when they blocked me by text message. It was like, that's, that's that's not necessary right now like that uh, you know it's their prerogative to do that but it, it felt kind of excessive and to me and like yeah I, I felt hurt by it um yeah yeah that's really helpful thanks for the example um Sylvia tweeted something recently about finding um opening yourself to love so finding a relationship that's very loving and noticing ways that you're opening yourself in that relationship, opening yourself up to love and then practicing doing that intentionally with other people. And I think um, Hanjo maybe replied to it saying something like uh, accepting love in all forms. Like there's, it wasn't until I read that that I realized how often I brush off other people's attempts for love and sort of like a vein of like oh I don't need it I'm good I love myself like I, I don't need your love you know and it is like it's like a pride thing or like uh, sometimes it can be a little painful to take in love from other people or sometimes it takes a little work to recognize love underneath somebody's act you know like somebody's doing something that feels a little like uh, it's hard to talk about this one without talking about the person explicitly. So I'm going to drop that one. But like, um, I think when I try to set boundaries, I try to come at it from a place of love all the time. Like at the end of the day, this is about loving ourselves and loving other people. Right. And like boundaries are how we protect ourselves so that we can keep the love flowing as much as possible we can give and receive as much love as possible we have to have good boundaries to be able to do that and I think sort of making that the focus of the boundary setting is what makes it typically go smoothly like I could have texted you and been like Tasha I'm exhausted and I feel overwhelmed and I have all this whole long list of stuff to do and reading your what you wrote is just not at the top of my list right now so I'm not going to read it or like obviously I wouldn't say that but that's just an example but something I could have done was just not mention it and like I did feel like I should say something to you because I had told you that I was planning to read it yesterday I'm in school Mondays and Tuesdays and so I was like I'm going to read this on Wednesday and I just wouldn't have felt right about after saying that then like not reading it or showing up with any feedback because I wouldn't have wanted you to think that I had forgotten or that like I had read it and not had any sort of response to it or anything. So it did feel important to me to reach out to you and acknowledge that I was shifting something there. Um, but I really wanted to highlight the fact that I'm so moved that you would write something really vulnerable and share that with me. Like that feels like such an act of love to me. And I wanted to be super clear about like the kind of space that I was in yesterday and the kind of like, it was a really intense day for me emotionally. And I was um, 
just exhausted from that. And it felt like the right thing to do last night was to completely rest and not do any sort of reading or any, you know, cognitive activities. And so taking care of myself was the best thing that I could do for both of us in that situation, but also really communicating that to you and really highlighting that, like, I, I value you so much as a friend and I love that you share your writing with me and I, I'm so excited to read it and I really want to do it from a specific place of, of, you know, coming into it with joy and excitement and love and not coming into it feeling like I've been working through intense fears all day and I'm exhausted and I'm not going to be able to fully focus on it. So I think that probably making making sort of keeping the focus on self-love and love for the other person when setting a boundary is um yeah is my strategy with it if you want to call it a strategy that just I didn't like the way that sounded as I said it but um I think the example that you gave is tough because the person was super triggered already and setting a boundary with someone who's like in the midst of a trigger is tough because they're trying to express all this stuff and it's not really expressing what the hurt thing is it's something else but you know for them to be ranting that stuff and then to experience what they feel is rejection is probably just extra triggering you know Mm -hmm. so I not to say that you shouldn't set a boundary there I think it still makes a lot of sense to set the boundary but doing it very carefully and like coming back to love for the person, you know, like, um, yeah, I don't know how I would suggest that. I don't know how much this person, you know, means to you in your life and how invested you are in this relationship. But I think that, and holding space for people looks drastically different based on the person, you know, like, I think I've told you this before that I feel like holding space for you is very easy for me because it's, um, not easy, but it's natural for me because it's, I think the way that you like having space held for you is very similar to the way that I like having space held for me. So I sort of ask you questions that I would want somebody to ask me in that situation. But I've noticed that that really doesn't work with other people in my life who, um, are looking for something really different when they're hurt. And so part of it too, is just feeling out what that person needs in that situation. If you are willing to give that to them, you know, and, um, You also just didn't know, you know, it's like, sometimes this happens. You don't, it's trial by fire. Like you didn't know that this person didn't like receiving voice memos. So that was kind of just unlucky there. And now, you know, the beauty of it is that as we learn these things by accidentally like crossing people's boundaries is then we can shuffle and adjust and next time it'll go smoother. So now you'll know in the future not to, not to send that person voice memos and I would just, I guess, be super careful with somebody who's already triggered and still try to be as loving as possible. I think that boundaries can always, like mostly always be set very lovingly. And so figuring out the way to do that, what that means for yourself and for that person in that moment is always going to be different, but focusing on that. Mm, That's beautiful. Yeah, I think I could have like, I mean, I, me- I mentioned that I was grateful that this person was being in touch with me and that I like liked hearing from them. And I think I could have mentioned that, like that I'm really grateful to be connected with them. I just don't really want to talk about this and don't want to argue in this way about it. Um, and I also could have mentioned maybe like that the reason I sent a voice memo, like that I'm happy to not send voice memos in the future, but that I did that because I thought it would convey more about like how I care about them and how I'm just setting a boundary so that we can be connected in a good way um, that it felt, you know, cause like a voice is, it's easier to do that, to say that in a way that someone can hear with your voice rather than text. Um, but uh, like that, that was coming from a place of love as well. Like those are things I could have done and might reach out to this person and say that now um, we're, we're still in contact. People will want to know. So <laughs> it's nice uh, and sort of, work things out, but, uh, might bear mentioning. Um, yeah, I think, I think that sort of answers the flip side question too, of like how to receive someone else's boundary is like connect to why that, that they're loving themselves and that that's a way of loving you as well. Like, Hey, I want to be 
connected to you, but to love myself, I need it to be in these forms. And like, this is how we can continue to be connected is like in this way. Um, just remembering that that's where they're coming from. Maybe it would help me to honor and respect other people's boundaries when they set them. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. I forgot about that part of the question. Um, yeah, I think that setting boundaries can be difficult and vulnerable, you know, and so recognizing first of all that someone is taking the trouble to do that like it's I always appreciate vulnerability and openness from other people and so that in itself is feels like an act of love to me and then it also shows that they care about the relationship they could just say fuck it and stop talking to you you know but like the fact that they're willing to come to you and say like I want to enhance our our relationship our dynamic in this way shows a lot to me about you know, them caring about our dynamic improving, which is really important. Um, I just love it in my relationships, like whether they're friendships or teacher coach relationships or whatever, because it takes so much guesswork out of it for me when I don't have to be asking about someone's boundary and like checking in. It's so nice to just know exactly where someone stands. And so I think like having like crisp boundaries is one of the most loving things you can do because you're not expecting anyone else to take care of you and you know feel things out and um I have noticed that in like various relationships that I have that some people when I set a boundary like some people will really take note of it and like even help me enforce it you know like check in like I know you have this boundary about this like is this okay and then there's other people who like on the other side of it will push up against it repeatedly and like that's okay too I can keep enforcing it but it really feels extra loving to me when people take note of my boundaries and remember them and um um really like act accordingly within the relationship and so I try to do that for other people too um, in terms of receiving boundaries, it, it just sort of feels like this beautiful game that we're playing together where the, we're making the rules as we go. And then we're always shifting them and like boundaries don't always have to be verbal either. They don't have to be explicit. Like sometimes you can just feel something, feel that something is not right for that person. And like, it's always okay for things to change. It's always okay for someone to come back to you later and say that thing that happened a week ago, like it didn't sit right with me. Now I'm just, <laughs> now I'm just doing the thing that you imitated me for on Twitter. That's hilarious. But <laughs> this thing didn't sit right with me and I journaled five pages about it and I realized I have a boundary there. So like, you know, after the fact is always okay too. Um, nothing, it's really hard to figure this stuff out on the spot in the moment. Um, so yeah, it's, it's always in flux. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think you've alluded recently to, and, and it was sort of present there, but like some specific people in your life that really have these like crisp boundaries and you're just totally clear. And I wonder if you could say more about what that's like or the kinds of boundaries that they have or, or just your experience of that, anything that might be relevant. Hmm. Yeah, I think that my one of my massage teachers comes to mind because I think of her as like so incredibly loving and also so firm. And all of her firmness feels like it comes from a place of love. Like even like she's very she's been very clear from the beginning that the class start time is the class start time and that's when we start and it's disrespectful to show up to class late because then we're going to have to repeat stuff that happened before you got here. And then it's going to bring your classmates down. Like we only have so many hours to learn this material. And if we have to slow down because people are late to class or people are coming back late from breaks, like it negatively impacts all of us. And she really set that boundary from the start. And I really noticed like how differently we behave as a class with start times and break times versus other classes we have with teachers who are less Clear about that and I imagine all of our teachers probably want people showing up to class on time but people are gonna um you know change their behavior according to the expectations and the boundaries and so 
maybe it was a little hard for her to, to do that right off the bat is to set this boundary. But because she did that, we've all been really cognizant of like getting to class on time and we've all benefited from it. And that feels so loving to me that she really cares about us getting as much um, out of our, our, our time with her, that she's going to set that boundary from the beginning. Like what could be more loving than that? She really cares about me becoming the best possible massage therapist I could be. And that's why she did that. Like it would have been easier for her to not say it at all. And to just like, Hey, if we show up to class 10 minutes late, it's 10 minutes less of teaching that she has to do, but it's not what she's in it for. And so there have been so many examples of that throughout the course of the class. Like she also told us right in that first hour of our first class that like, I am your biggest fan. I believe in each and every one of you. I think that all of you, even before knowing you well, I think all of you can become great massage therapists. And like, that's like, no one has more faith in you than I do. And so it's really interesting to witness somebody who is that um, invested in all of us and really cares about all of us and is also so firm with her boundaries. I've learned a lot from her about that, um, just in terms of the way we communicate with each other too. And like, I don't, she was never overly like gushy and close and like chummy with any of us. But I could also know that like, if something came up, which it did for me in one of the first classes is like some emotional stuff came up for me and I went to talk to her about it. And I just started crying because it was like right there. And I, I, am, I knew that I, I was safe doing that because of the type of container she had created so early on. And so it's like, I know that this person is not my, my friend. I know that we're not gonna socialize outside of class because I can tell what her professional boundaries are. But I also know that if I have something coming up, emotion, like an emotional thing coming up in class, it's going to affect my ability to practice on somebody or get practiced on that I can go to her and she will immediately put her hand on my shoulder, talk to me about what's happening and, you know, help me move through it for the, you know, for the sake of me and her and the entire class. And so does that kind of give an idea of that? I think it's like, it's not even firm yet loving. It is like firmness as, as a, as an act of love. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful to hear that described. And I could see how that would really help your, your, your training and your education there. And it actually reminds me of like, um, when I was in like middle school and high school noticing like specifically substitute teachers, like a lot of the substitute teachers, there was just a feeling of like, oh, kids are just going to walk all over the substitute teacher and like not do their work and not do follow the rules. And then there are other ones that you're like, oh, you know, everyone's going to follow what mm. the substitute teacher is and like is saying and what, what the rules are. And like I, at the time, it didn't make sense to me. I was just like, or, or just with teachers generally, I was like, why is this teacher just a total pushover? And this other teacher is like really you know, like people admire them and respect what they have to share. And it wasn't obvious to me at the time, but I think that this example really clarifies that sort of thing of like, just being really clear about like why they're doing what they're doing, who they are, what their own boundaries are, what the rules are for the, the environment and the container and like being explicit about that. And that really sets everyone up to, to succeed in that kind of environment. That's such a good point. That's a, yeah, that's really resonant for me about various teachers growing up and like, it is so nice when the rules are coming from a place of love and it's not like because I said so because I'm the teacher and you're the student you know but like it's this is not a power dynamic thing this is about a container where everyone thrives and and gets the most out of it possible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so I'd love to ask you about massage school since we're sort of close to that and I'd just be curious like to start wh why you got interested in massage and why you decided to take that training yourself and develop skill in it. Yeah, so yeah, it's been kind of a long road of career exploration for me over the last two years or so, probably. Yeah, right when I moved to Asheville is when I started. It was like, yeah, this part of my life clicked into place. So let's see about this career part that could still be more locked into place. Um, yeah, I worked with a career coach and I, I started exploring a lot of different directions. And I mean, I was really starting 
the exploration piece from scratch. Like I did Myers-Briggs tests, you know, and like, okay, like what types of jobs do INFPs do? Um, I don't know, looking back now, if like that's, I don't know, that's a whole other subject. But um, every, I was exploring everything from like, leading hikes, you know, wilderness, wilderness stuff, whether that was just casual hikes or like maybe some kind of wilderness therapy um, to thinking about becoming a therapist, maybe like a relationship therapist. Esther Perel is such a, uh, a role model for me. Um, I thought about going into user experience design. Um, that was somewhere where the career coach I found was very helpful because a good coach or therapist can help you identify biases and stories and patterns that you don't even recognize in yourself. And like, she definitely helped me with that with UX because I had worked at tech companies. And so user experience design is the people at the tech company who design what the app looks like and also the workflow of it. Um, and so it's really different from engineering, especially the type of engineering that I was doing. And I didn't realize until I worked with a career coach that I had this idea in my head about designers. Like, I think that engineers really often think highly of themselves. And there is this whole like power dynamic within tech companies that I had noticed. And it was what I had identified when I first started working there as a tester and been like, clearly that person is above me in the hierarchy. So I wanna be an engineer. So I think a lot of engineers kind of like look down on user experience design. And I think that I did without even really realizing that I did. And so I was talking to the career coach and I was like, I wanna do something more empathetic, like, and more, um, more human focused than what I do now. And she was, I was like, sort of like user experience design, but not user experience design, obviously. And she was like, well, why not? And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I kind of had to question those ideas that I had about it for the first time. And so that was the whole journey of exploration that I did. Um, I took a, a pretty intense, like maybe like three month class or something. I designed a whole app. Um, I started talking to people at the company where I worked about it and they let me, um, start working with the UX team. I was doing like halftime engineering, halftime design work. And so I was getting all of this, um, like on the job experience right off the bat, which was really, really nice and accommodating of them. And I got to work with, it was such a talented design team. I learned a lot from them and empathy really is at the heart of user experience design. And I, I really loved that about it. Everything is about the user and you're constantly coming up with, you know, ideating, coming up with ideas for the app and then checking in with users at every step of the process to see, is this what you want? Is this solving your problem? Have I correctly identified your problem? How could this be better? What did you not like about using this? What would your ideal solution and, you know, those types of questions and even just learning how to, how to ask questions. Um, these people kind of joke about this on Twitter about like <laughs> the questions that I ask people and I'm always like, why, why, why? And that's like such a thing in user experience design. I think it's called like the five whys is that when you ask someone a question, you have to keep asking why usually like three to five times to really get at the root of like what the problem is that they're experiencing. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was a huge shift from the type of engineering that I did. I had no contact whatsoever with the user and I just didn't think about them that much. I was very much like in my own little world of just me and the code. Um, and so it was a really positive shift. I really appreciated that it's really humbling to be constantly putting your heart and soul into this solution and then to go to the user and it's totally wrong it's like you got to abandon it and you know it just wasn't right and so um I appreciated that aspect of it it's like you're on this quest for truth and it's very humbling and very empathetic and you need really good communication skills to figure out how to correctly identify a user's problem to even begin coming up with solutions for it I was still exploring like therapy on the side although I wasn't sure um, dipping like my toes in wasn't, it wasn't clear to me how to do that with therapy. Like, was I going to have to get a master's degree 
you know, to become a therapist? What was that road going to look like? And then what if I didn't like it after all that? And it, it was hard to imagine um, going to work all day and talking through everyone's intense, intense problems, intense emotions, and then to come home at the end of the day and take care of myself and like potentially a family if I have a family after having done it all day. It did seem like that was going to be really hard, but I had just the more experiences I had with healing myself, the more psychedelic therapy that I did, the more therapy in general, other types, IFS, energy work, shadow work, everything, the more it felt clear to me that like I wanted to help people via therapy. I just, it's the kind of thing that I love, obviously I love tweeting about it. I love thinking about it. I love reading it or reading about it. It's just what I'm really drawn to. Um, and so UX was moving definitely in that direction, but I was still at a company where I did not feel really aligned with the, the overall mission and I was not excited about the tech itself. Um, and the more I started learning about trauma and the way that we store it in our bodies, the more I felt like maybe becoming a traditional therapist wasn't the right fit for me. I wanted to work more directly with the body. Um, and so what would that look like? Would it like some sort of somatic experiencing or IFS stuff? I've always loved getting massages. I never really got them regularly when I was younger. Maybe I would get like one to three a year. And then when COVID started, I, I stopped getting them all together. But then, um, when things like massage places started opening back up, I found someone in Asheville. I had been trying for a while to find the right person and just not clicking with anyone. I found the right person and we started having these, I started just having these profound healing experiences within that, like, and his ability to create that is like, it's shamanic, you know, there's, it, it absolutely is. And so that was kind of happening at the same time. And I think massage is a good fit for me for a number of reasons. Like I really like quiet. I've just always liked quiet and been very comfortable in it. I like connecting with other people quietly. I like being around people and sort of just being and not necessarily like talking or talking a lot. Um, I really like touch. I'm like less bothered by nudity than a lot of other people, I would say. And um, yeah, I love getting massages and it's been so healing for me that I, I um, yeah, I think it, it's, everything has just kind of fallen into place. I also, like, I happened to be in Asheville already, and Asheville turns out to be this amazing massage community. I mean, most other people in my program don't live in Asheville, like, either moved here for this program or are commuting from a couple of hours away um, to come to this school, and it happens to be, like, less than 15 minutes from my house, so it, everything just clicked into place in that way. And I mean, I still like had lots of doubts, continue to have a lot of fear come up. Like, what if I'm not strong enough? I'm five two and kind of petite, you know, like what if I can't deliver pressure that people need? What if I don't end up having the like intuitive skill to do this? But um, yeah, you know, moving, moving through them one by one as they come up. And so far I, I just love it and I love, I love the school. I love the educational experience that they're providing. It's like, I, they're very aware of how traumatizing a lot of school and educational experiences can be and have been for a lot of people. And I feel like they're actively helping us move through it as we move through this program. And so, yeah, I love it so far. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, what, what is the, like, program entail for learning massage? Like, how do you go about learning massage? Yeah, so it's different in every state because the, the licensing is by state and they're, they're, the requirements are slightly different. Um, in North Carolina, it's 600 hours. And so there's all different types of like schedules you could do. I had actually planned originally to keep my job and do the weekend program. And I'm so glad that I didn't do that. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, and it would have wow. lasted a year. So that would have, 
I kind of like knew in the back of my head as I was making that plan that it wasn't going to work, but I was like, I'll figure it out later. And then I did figure it out. I left my job. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm doing a seven month. It's been two a day for the first two months. And now we're going to add a third day. Um, But let's see. So of the 600 hours, 100 hours is clinic work. So that's actually giving massages to customers that come in. And they're paying like a really discounted rate. You know, it's like 30 bucks for an hour long massage. Um, But so I start that next week and I'll do a hundred hours of massage as part of the program. So I'm so excited about that because it'll be great to graduate from the program, having all of this experience already with new people. Um, So I won't have to like go out into the world to um, either getting a job or, or starting my own business, just never having given massages to strangers before. Um, so the other 500 hours it's classroom stuff, we just wrapped up the Swedish massage unit. So that was 80 hours. And I think that that's the biggest chunk that we do of anything. Um, and Swedish just means like classical massage techniques. So it's like the goal is mainly relaxation more so than like really deep tissue, kind of the trauma healing thing that, uh, that we've been talking about. Um, And then from there, we do a lot of classes that are maybe like four to 12 hours total. And so it'll just be a real quick, like we just did our first chair massage class last week and we're going to do one more next week and then we're done with that. So it's like, obviously we're not going to be giving amazing chair massages after that. But if you find that you really click with that style, then you can kind of go off and and learn more about it on your own and and, um, make that a part of your practice. They really highlight that like there is no cookie cutter massage or there shouldn't be and everyone should um figure out like make their own personalized massage experience for for what resonates for them and what works for them and and their body and their personality and their touch so yeah I mean we have all kinds of introductory stuff like herbology um shiatsu hydrotherapy pregnancy massage chair massage thai sports massage um we'll get all these little introductory things. There's like a little bit about business and marketing and ethics and like North Carolina laws. And um, there's an energy work session. I'm so excited for that. Uh, Yeah, so um, kind of you get like basics, fundamentals. Oh, obviously there's also a lot of like um, anatomy and physiology too. So that's a a little bit more of like a classroom and textbook approach. Um, And yeah. Hmm. That's fascinating to learn about. It seems like such a good, well-rounded curriculum for learning massage. I'm just excited for you hearing about that. Thanks. Uh, I'm excited too. I mean, it's so cool to get all these little glimpses and it's like, uh, so far I love all of it. I want to incorporate all of it. I want to do the herbal, like we've done herbology already. It's like, oh, how can I make my own massage oils that are like, this one is better for bone stuff. This one's better for muscle stuff. This one is more of like a fall versus a summer. And then we also just did a reflexology unit, which is like manipulating hands and feet to like um, address meridians that move all the way through the body. So you could be like working on someone's kidney by pressing on a certain spot on their foot. And it's like, oh, wow, I would love to incorporate this into my massage too. So it's just, it's so much. And uh, you know, it's only so much I can actually, um, explore in more detail but what a what a fascinating world Mm. is there anything uh adjacent to everything that we've talked about that you'd like to share more about or talk more about i guess maybe just that like the boundary stuff that we talked about is so important with massage stuff um Mm. like I'm realizing that like being a good space holder in itself is just such a massive skill set that um, doesn't naturally, maybe doesn't come naturally to a lot of people. And it's like really worth, I mean, like I said before, I think holding space for people who are similar to you can be easier, but like the goal, I think with like being a therapist, like a massage therapist is I would love to be able to hold space for people who are totally different from me in terms of their relationship to emotions and their bodies and have very different spiritual beliefs to me and beliefs in general about the world. And, you know, how can I make space and create safe containers for those people too? 
And so, um, yeah, I think that obviously like there's all these physical boundaries with massage that are incredibly important, but also just like energetic boundaries. We had this um, talk in a class one time about like, sometimes people who are drawn to these healer professions, like there's sort of a codependency aspect of it, which is that I need people to need me. I need to fix their problems. Like if someone is coming to me and they have this issue and I'm telling, I'm giving them a referral for a specialist that they should see that would really help them with that issue. And they're not following up on that, but they keep coming to me for massage. Like, am I going to resent them for that? No, because it's totally their decision and it's their life and it's their body and they should do what works for them. So it's not my job to decide what that person's goals are and like to, yeah, I can, I could have totally seen myself falling into some of those patterns without realizing it if we hadn't had that discussion. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so glad that we've talked about it. And I did like when I um, started going to my current massage therapist, I was working my engineering job and I was really busy all the time at that point. And so I wasn't really taking care of my body and I don't think my posture was necessarily very good. I mean, I'd had chronic back issues kind of coming up for a while. And so I felt like I knew I had some back stuff that I really wanted to address. And so I started just um, investing the money to see him like every two to three weeks for 90 minutes and really, really, really work on my back. And I felt really guilty when I would go to him because I felt like he would do all this incredible work on my back. And then I would leave and my back would feel really good for a couple of days, but then I would you know, go back to work and be really busy and sort of ignore my body and be in these tense positions and not processing emotional stuff that was happening throughout the day. And I would go back to him two or three weeks later, and my back would be a wreck again. And it, I, I wondered if he resented me for that because it was sort of like I was, he was doing all of this hard work and I was just undoing it and then coming back to him and asking him to like do it again. And like, it's totally within people's right to do that and to just ask a massage therapist to work with what's in front of them. And um, some people have chronic pain that like a massage is just going to give them one hour of relief from otherwise chronic pain. And that's great. Like, it's amazing. If you can do that for someone, you're not going to fix it. It's not going to go away, but you can provide a brief period of relief. Like what a gift, right? So um, I think that that's been a really cool world colliding thing of, of massage education and all, uh, all this boundary stuff that I've been thinking about for a while is like what it means to be a good space holder and what it means to really tune into what someone wants for themselves and help craft um, a treatment, you know, a treatment plan around that rather than deciding like, I know what's best for your body and this is what I want for you. And we're going to make that happen. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I've loved how hearing how really all the topics that we've talked about really seamlessly integrate into each other. Like you were talking about how it's really natural that shadow work would be related to your boundaries. And, you know, mm -hmm. also, um, you know, you and I have talked a lot about like energy and energy dynamics with people and stuff like that. And that totally relates to boundaries as well. And hearing mm -hmm. that it fits into massage as well. And, and kind of also just generally like, uh, sort of like professional relationships of, of various kinds, like boundaries are totally relevant there too. And um, yeah, it's been interesting to hear the kind of like threads through seemingly disparate topics in the way that you're connecting them. Yeah, just so many synchronicities in my life right now. It's awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, Jane. It's been really delightful to learn more about you and also to share your wisdom and love with the world. So thank you for talking with me. Oh, it's always so good talking to you, Tasha. I love you. Love you too.